Open your Bibles in Luke chapter 3 today. I want to talk to you about the greatest man who ever lived, as your outline has titled on the top. I didn't give it away in the title, because I wanted you to wonder. How many of you know who the greatest man who ever lived was? I'm not talking about Jesus. Some, some could say you could hardly call him a man. I want to talk today about John the Baptist. Jesus was speaking about John in Matthew chapter 11, 11, and he said to them, what man is there among you who has, oh, I've got my verses mixed up, I'm sorry. Jesus said, there is no man greater born among women besides John the Baptist. He's the greatest man that ever was lived. But Jesus said that John, even though he was the greatest, would be the least in the kingdom of heaven. When I read that, I think, what makes John the Baptist so great? Why was he so useful? Why was he at the top of God's list when God looked at all of the people in the world? What made him elevated in God's sight? I want to start in Luke chapter 3. Starting in verse 1. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate began being governor of Judea, Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip tetrarch of of Iturea, and the region of Traconitus, and Lysanias tetrarch of Abilene, while Annas and Caiaphas were high priests. The word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places will be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Then he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So the people asked him, saying, What shall we do then? He answered and said to them, He who has two tunics, let him give to him who has none. And he who has food, let him do likewise. Then tax collectors came to be baptized and said, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than what is appointed for you. Likewise the soldiers asked him, saying, And what shall we do? So he said to them, Do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely and be content with your wages. Now as the people were in expectation and all reason in their hearts about John, whether he was the Christ or not, John answered, saying to all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor. And gather the wheat into his barn. For the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. And with many other exhortations, he preached to the people. Let's pray. Dear God, I thank you so much for this day and for your word that you've given to us. God, I thank you so much that you call men out. You call us out. To be separated to you. To be used by you. To have an impact on the world around us, just like John the Baptist did. God, I thank you so much for his testimony, for the stand that he took, that his life was completely yours. Help us to see the qualities in John, God, that you want to see inside of us. Help us to walk in his footsteps, Lord, as he took a stand for you and shared the truth with everyone around him. I pray you'd speak your word to us and that you'd have your way in our lives today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 
There are a lot of great people in the Bible that God puts his stamp of approval on. We think of the greatest men and women of the Bible. We think of Moses and, and Abraham, King David, Sarah and Ruth, Elijah and Peter and Paul. And all these people had their own little faults and, and, and downfalls. Yet, nothing really is pointed out in John's life. John lived a life that was pretty separated. Jesus said that of everyone born of woman, that John is the greatest. What made him stand out? Why did Jesus single him out when he was talking about him? When he evaluates our lives, what's he looking for? He's looking for the same things he was looking for in John. You know, John's life got started uh, before he was born uh, as a prophecy. His birth was prophetic. It was foretold in the Old Testament about one crying out in the wilderness. John came, his purpose is stated, to prepare the way of the Lord. He came to prepare the way for Christ to come. He was a messenger sent before. He knew Jesus was coming. And he was telling everybody to get ready. Something big's taking place. You're about to see history. And you don't want to be on the wrong side of it. John was preparing the way for Christ. I want to look at some things that make John stand out in his life. Some things that we need if we're going to be the kind of Christians that God looks at and says, that is my servant. That's the person that I'm going to be able to use. Because God wants to use us. Listen, Christian, if you're in here and you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, don't just be happy sitting on your hands in church on Sunday morning. Don't just play around with religion. Don't play around with Christianity like it's just some add-on in your life. God wants to use you. He wants your life to count and to mean something. And John understood what that meant. He knew what the purpose to his life was. God called him, and he accepted that call. He submitted to it. So what are some of the things in John's life that sticks out? Turn back to Luke chapter 1, verse 15. I want you to notice one thing the Bible says about John. I'll start in verse 13. The angel appeared to Zacharias to tell him about a son that would be born. It said in verse 13, But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He shall, not, he shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And one of the things I want to point out in this passage is that Jesus said John would be filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to tell you this was before Pentecost in the book of Acts. The Holy Spirit's operation was a little bit different than it is for us today. I don't think some Christians are even aware that there is an operation of the Holy Spirit. If you're a believer, you need to understand that you cannot be who God wants you to be apart from the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. You are commanded to get intimately acquainted with what the Bible teaches about the Holy Spirit and His role in your life and the work He's trying to do inside of you. The Bible teaches us that the Holy Spirit is God. When you became a Christian, the Holy Spirit came to live inside of you. In fact, that's God's mark on your life. The moment you got saved, the Bible says the Holy Spirit came to indwell you. And so when God looks on this earth, the Bible says that He knows those who are His. That's the mark. If you have the mark of the Holy Spirit in your life, He looks at you, He says, that, that one's mine. The Holy Spirit's a mark guaranteeing your salvation. But that's not all He is. The Holy Spirit gives us the power to live the way that God wants us to. He convicts our heart. He leads us in directions. He uh, enables us to have fellowship with God, to be able to hear God's voice. 
The Holy Spirit is God. He's the third member of the Trinity. But John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit. Before Pentecost, after Jesus died, the Holy Spirit just kind of went and filled whoever he wanted for whatever purpose. Sometimes it was for a moment of work and, and, and it was kind of an on and off thing. But the Bible teaches now, if you're a Christian, that the Holy Spirit indwells you, that he's always present. Even if you're a Christian and you're not living right. That's kind of a weird thought, isn't it? You know what that means, essentially, is that as a Christian, if the Holy Spirit's living inside of me and I'm living in rebellion and I'm living in sin, I'm dragging God through that with me. Because the Holy Spirit indwells me. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit never leaves. But the Bible says that we need to be also filled with the Holy Spirit. Now you can be saved and be indwelled by the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit marks you. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you're filled with the Holy Spirit. On your paper, Ephesians 5.18 is written out. It says, Do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation or drunkenness, but be filled with... With the Spirit. And circle that phrase, be filled. Be filled with the Spirit. John the Baptist was led by the Holy Spirit and empowered by the Holy Spirit to do the things he did and to say the things he said. And just like in the book of Acts, whenever the disciples went out and preached the gospel and shared the truth with people, it always, said, it always says before they start preaching that they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Whenever there's a great sermon about to be preached in the book of Acts, especially in the beginning, it says they were, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, this is really interesting. You've got to understand that these disciples who were out in the streets telling people about Christ, that when Jesus was taken away, they all ran and hid. These were not very brave, courageous people. Just like we are sometimes. We're not very brave and courageous. It's hard for us to take a stand sometimes, isn't it? Public opinion comes against us. It's not popular to teach a lot of the things that the Bible teaches. We teach about morality. We teach about getting right with God, about the right way to live. And it's not just because these things are our opinion, but God tells us how to live. He tells us what things can destroy our lives. He tells us what things can bless our lives. And it's our job as believers to stand up for the truth, to call sin, sin, and, and to call righteousness, righteousness. But that takes courage. Listen, courage I don't have. The disciples didn't have it either. But when they got up to preach in the streets after Jesus rose from the dead, something changed. Because the Bible says the indwelling of the Holy Spirit started, started for the, everyone who believes. Everyone who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ was indwelt with the Spirit. And these men were also filled with the Holy Spirit, just like John the Baptist and John got up and preached some hard messages. He told the truth right to people's face. And you know what you and I need right now more than anything? We don't need patted on the backs. We don't need just comfort. And we do need that sometimes. But we need truth. It's truth that changes our lives. It's truth that gets us going in the right direction. Listen, it's truth that heals. Jesus said you will know the truth and the truth will do what? It will make you free. You and I need truth. And sometimes the only person who tells us the truth is God. Why? Because, I don't know, sometimes we don't have the courage to stand up and tell the truth. But the disciples and John the Baptist, they got up and told the truth. Most Christians, I believe, tend to minimize the Holy Spirit's role in their lives. We need to realize it's the Holy Spirit that drew you to belief in Christ in the first place. You know, you and I can't on our own just go to God. The Holy Spirit has to draw you. When I got saved, I remember this, that, that experience, and I didn't even understand what was going on. I didn't grow up in church. I didn't know anything about God or the Bible or how God worked. I didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit. But I remember when I was 13, I had heard the gospel a number of times, and at some certain point, my heart just was different when I was listening to it. I knew that something... I, people just describe it like this, and I know it's vague and it sounds weird, but it's just a tugging on your heart. There might be a better description for it, but I just remember feeling like God was just tugging on my heart. And I sat down at one message, and a preacher got up and shared his testimony about how Jesus Christ 
saved him and changed his life. And the Holy Spirit tugged on my heart so much I couldn't ignore it anymore. And I want to tell you, if you're in here and you're not a Christian, and you felt that tug on your heart when you've heard about what Jesus did for you, you've realized that, well, you know what? The, the Bible says I need to get saved. I better do that. Listen, don't ignore that. That tugging on your heart, don't ignore that. Now, you can get to a point in your life where you turn God's voice off so much that, well, he's not, he might not bother speaking to you anymore. I don't know how he operates in each individual person's life, but it's dangerous to ignore God speaking to you. The book of Hebrews, in chapter uh, 2, it says, How can we neglect so great a salvation? Listen, the Holy Spirit draws you to salvation. But if he's speaking to your heart about getting saved, don't ignore him. How can you neglect what Jesus Christ did for you? He gave everything he was, everything he had. He laid it on the cross for you. He sacrificed his own body for you. How can you ignore it? If the Holy Spirit's drawing you to himself, you need to say yes to him. Say yes to what the Holy Spirit's trying to say about your relationship with God, about your standing before him. Listen, it's not just about salvation, but we can't even live successfully apart from the Holy Spirit's work in our life. Every believer is indwelled, but not every, every believer is controlled or filled. This Ephesians verse explains that. It compares being drunk versus being filled with the Spirit. And basically, when you're filled with wine, it's the wine that controls you. Right? When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, it's... The Holy Spirit controlling you. You're allowing Him to control your life. You're allowing Him to lead you, to point you. When He convicts you of sin in your life, you listen to Him instead of your own flesh. When you have a decision to make, you seek Him for guidance. The Holy Spirit wants to guide us in life. But being filled to, with the Holy Spirit means that we have opened ourselves up to Him. We're willing to submit to Him and commit those areas of our life to Him that He speaks to us about. It's becoming dedicated to do His will. It's, uh, it's having the mindset of being at God's attention. How many of you are in the military? When your sergeant or your, your, when your drill sergeant or commander said attention, what did you do? You, you stopped what you were doing. You put your feet together. You put your, your thumb up on your forehead. And you got ready to what? To listen. You got ready to obey. And when the Holy Spirit is speaking to us, we need to be in that mindset. To be at attention, to be ready to obey. Being filled with the Spirit means that we're in that place. You've probably been to a restaurant before where the waitress or waiter says, Can I warm your coffee up for you? And you say yes. And they come back with a hot pot and, and fill that cup up. And it's nice and warm and ready to drink again. You know, our lives are like that sometimes. The way the Bible describes being filled with the Holy Spirit is it's something that we continually need. We continually need it. Why? We get worn out sometimes. We get emptied sometimes, right? The Bible teaches us that we're not perfect human beings. We need to go to God continually for a filling. We need to say, God, I need to give this day to you. I want to stop right now and pause and just, before I make any decisions... I want to give this day, I want to give these next decisions to you. I've got to go to work. I've got decisions I need to make. I've got choices I, 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 I need to decide about. I don't want to give this day to you. Walking in the Spirit saying, God, fill me with the Spirit again. Help me to be at attention. Help me to be ready to obey. John the Baptist was always at attention. He was always ready to obey God no matter what, even from a young child. And he left his home and went out to live in the wilderness at the Holy Spirit's direction. Because God had a special calling on His life. And you need to understand, if you're a Christian, God has a calling on your life. But if you're not at attention, if you're over here in the background playing around somewhere where God's calling out to people and you're not listening, you can miss the whole thing. John wasn't playing games. When God led him out somewhere, he went right to where God wanted him to go. We can't play around with... God speaking to us. We have to be ready, be ready every single moment of our life to, to do what He wants. Andrew Murray said this about the Holy Spirit. May not a single moment of my life be spent outside of the light and love and joy of God's presence. And not a moment 
without the entire surrender of myself as a vessel for Him to be full of the Holy Spirit and His love. This is a Christian that understood the necessity of being filled with the Holy Spirit in order to experience His fellowship, to know what God's love is. We need to start walking in the Spirit as Christians. Listen, we don't even know as a church what God wants us to do unless we're in tune with the Holy Spirit. I'm going to tell you this too. Guys, listen, we can't even get along with each other unless we're filled with the Holy Spirit. Do you know that? You can't do it. Why? Because, well, we just all rub each other the wrong way sometimes, don't we? We just do that. That's just human nature. We rub each other the wrong ways. We got on each other's nerves. We're all made of flesh and bones. But see, when we're tuned into the Holy Spirit, we're going to be running on the same frequency. It's like if you have a hundred pianos in the same room and they, the pianists start playing all the same song and they're hitting the same keys at the same time. You know what? That, the music's going to sound horrible if all the pianos are out of tune. If they're not tuned into each other. But if someone stood up and took a, a tuning fork and hit that tuning fork on something steel and held it up and, and, and the pianists all tuned their piano to that tuning fork, you know what? When they played after that tuning... It would sound great. They would be harmony. Why? Because they're all tuned in to the one tuning fork. Listen, if God's going to use us as a church, First Baptist, we need to understand that each one of us as a believer needs to be tuned in to Jesus Christ. We need to be tuned in to the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. If we're not tuned in to Jesus Christ, there's not going to be any oneness or unity. Why? Because we all go in, in different directions. Someone once told me that anything with more than one head is a monster. This church doesn't have more than one head. The head of this church is Jesus Christ. And you know what? If we're going to do anything for Him, we need to submit to Him, get in tune with Him. Look, if I'm in tune with Him, and you're in tune with Him, and your neighbor's in tune with Him, we're all going to be going in the same direction. Why? Because I'm not going to be obeying my commands. I'm going to be following Christ. And he's going to tell us to be doing the same things. Let me tell you how that works in a marriage. It works well in a marriage. When you and your spouse are tuned in to Jesus Christ, you're going in the same direction. You're following the same Lord. He's telling you the same things. He, he, he's giving you commands to follow that strengthen you and, and build your life up. Make your family strong. But it's key that both people be following the Lord for it to work the way that God wants it to. But John the Baptist was spirit-filled. He was willing and ready to obey the Holy Spirit whenever and whatever he told him to do. The next thing is this. John lived a separated life. Matthew 3, 4 says, And John himself was clothed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. I just read this in our children's Bible to our kids the other day, and my boys go, Ew! I want to eat a locust. But John was out there. He, he lived a completely separated life. God called him completely out of materialism. He didn't want any distractions for John. John's calling was so special and so set apart that he was brought out of everything. John wanted his focus to be completely on Christ and on what the message was. So he was clothed in camel's hair. He had a leather belt and he ate just what was crawling around on the ground out in the wilderness. You know, his food and his clothing were far from fashionable. And I don't believe God's telling us to walk around in, in, in sackcloth and have our heads covered with ashes. We're not supposed to be living our lives like, like monks. But he calls us out in a very similar way. But John lived a strict, separated, and disciplined life. Here's the whole point to us, and what applies to us is, John didn't conform to the world around him. And God calls us as believers to not conform to the world around us. The Bible says that the world has an aggressive, an aggressive pull on each one of us. There's a system, there's a whole system that's against God and against God's commands, against what God teaches. A whole system that works against truth, sometimes purposely, sometimes unknowingly. But when we're separated, we're coming out of that system. When you got saved, you became part of the kingdom of God. Did you know that? The kingdom of God came to live inside of you. Jesus Christ lives inside of you. 
God's kingdom is all on this earth in that sense, is that He lives inside of you. You know what that means? If, if His kingdom lives inside of you, it means that you and I live by different rules. We don't live by the rules the world has. We have a higher system to live by. We have a greater authority to submit to. We only follow the rules down here insofar as they don't contradict what our Heavenly Father up there says. And He tells us to submit to authority and everything like that. That's true. But you see, the disciples in the book of Acts didn't submit to authority every time. When they told them to quit following God, to quit preaching the gospel, they went up and they disregarded what the authorities said, what the government said. You know why? Because God's commands are higher than anybody's. Jesus in the Great Commission said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and what? Make disciples of all nations. What's it based on? What's the, our call to go and preach the gospel to other people? It's based on the authority of Jesus Christ. You know what? When we, so our our, our uh, denomination supports missionaries all over the world. They even go into countries where they're not allowed to. What authority can they do that based on? It's on the authority of Jesus Christ. He has the authority. He's told us to. We live by God's command. Why? Because we're separated. We live by a different system of rules than the people around us. Matthew eleven eighteen it says, For John came neither eating or drinking. In Mark six twenty it says, Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just and holy man. This is, this is an interesting verse. Herod feared John. John was just some guy out in the middle of the desert preaching to whoever would walk by and listen. And the king was scared of him. The king, the person who was ruling everything in the area, was scared of John. Why? Why was he scared of him? Because he knew that John was a righteous person. John lived righteously. He was separated and he was intimidated by that. He was a just and holy man. Listen, you need to understand, if you know Jesus Christ, when we live righteous lives, it convicts the hearts of people around us. God calls us to live righteously. You know, when we know, if you're a Christian, you know your righteousness is from Christ, right? You don't have any real righteousness of your own. Our whole life, or the goal of our life once we get saved is to, is to allow God to turn us are, are, to make our lives look more and more like Jesus Christ every day. He tries to make you more righteous every day. This is the Holy Spirit's work in your life. He tries to cause righteousness to come out of your life. You let the life and righteousness of Christ come outside of you. It's not that you're any good, but it's the righteousness of Christ coming out. And listen, if you're a Christian and you're living righteously, you're letting, him, you're letting Jesus Christ live through you, people around you are going to be affected by that. The hearts of people around you will be convicted. They'll know that the message you have is the real thing. You know, this is one of the reasons why people around us try to get Christians to do the same things that they're doing. Because they don't want to think that what they're doing is wrong. When we stand up and we tell the truth about what God says about one thing or another thing, when we tell the truth and we're living according to that, there's power in that. There's power in your testimony. Your testimony is how your life presents Jesus Christ to other people. And we need to have good testimonies. God calls us to have a, a good testimony to people around us. Let me ask you a question. With the people you're around at work or school, or when you're around your relatives, if you were the only person in the world that they had to form an opinion of Jesus on, what would their opinion of Jesus be? What's your testimony, your life say about who Jesus is? We all have a testimony. And the way we live affects other people, sometimes eternally. When we resist temptations and refuse to live the way the world lives around us, it shows people that what you have is real. John separated himself in an extreme way. God had him separated extremely because he didn't want any distractions for John. But John went out and he didn't care what he had to give up. He didn't care what he had to give up. You know, I don't think God's going to call you to go live in a cave. All right? He's probably not going to call you to go live in a desert. What are you afraid that God's going to try to get you to do? 
Sometimes we, we, we're scared to step out and do what God wants us to do because we're just kind of afraid of the results. But you know, that's kind of silly because God knows the future. And the Bible tells me He has my best interest in heart. Those are some things I can't deny. So why do I hesitate following God? Why do I, I hesitate being separated to Him? Saying, I'm going to put my life to the side for God only. It's going to be completely reserved to Him. Now listen, I, I don't want to intimidate people into, into stepping into the Christian life and living the way God wants because you, you might think, oh man, I, I'm, not, I'm not really a very perfect person. How can I have a good testimony to people? Oh listen, I remember when I got saved that all, all my friends around me when I got saved when I was a teenager, but they were just looking for me to make some mistake. They were waiting for me to make some mistake. They were trying to get me to make mistakes. All right? And I, 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 I imagine that I did you know what? Nobody in this world is perfect, but if you're a Christian, when you fall and when I fall, you know what our response to that should be? It should be to repent, to go back to God, to get forgiveness and get back up on our feet. Turning around in your life is also a testimony to other people. You're telling other people, hey, you know, I made a mistake here, but I know that's wrong. God's commands are supreme to any decisions I make. His law is the law. And I made a mistake and I'm getting that thing out of my life. I'm getting it right. So even when people see faults in us, it's, it's how we re- respond to our own faults that can make an impact also. Listen, in Philippians 1.27 it says, Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs. That you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. God wants our conduct to be worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I was driving around with a pastor friend of mine. We were going to um, a pastor's uh, fellowship meeting. And uh, he was was telling me one day, he said, This reminds me of the, um, the time someone pulled out in front of me on my way to another pastor's meeting last year. And, uh, well, you know how I am when I'm, when I'm driving. Uh, when he pulled out in front of me, I just got right on his tail. And probably for 10 miles, I was, probably was this far behind him. This is, you know, a pastor I know. And he said, I, I followed him for 10 miles, and he took a right, right into the church that I was going to go to. He was a pastor at the fellowship meeting that I was going to. And uh, he said he very awkwardly got out of his car at the same time and walked into the building. And I forget how he said he responded. But you know what? Have you ever been caught like that in a moment where you're just, you weren't really being very spiritual? I'm sure he he apologized and and, and spoke some words. But um, when we can admit our faults, that goes a long way. People don't have to see that you're a perfect, holier-than-thou kind of person, right? But they need to see that we're real, that we're honest about our own sins and about our own mistakes. There are plenty of people that God used in the Bible that had some pretty serious errors in their life, some pretty serious sins in their life. Don't let your past scare you away from following God and from getting back on the right track because God welcomes you back. He lets you back on track. We talked on Wednesday. We're going through uh, the book of Galatians. And how Peter made mistake after mistake after mistake. And uh, the, the, there's one issue in Peter's life that he, did, he made another mistake that we're studying. Uh, you remember Peter first, he was always a person putting his foot in his mouth and, and just doing very rash things. Uh, he said he would never leave Jesus and, and Jesus told him, you're going to deny me three times. Remember, Peter denied Jesus three times. And then he, Jesus reinstated Peter. And then... And we'll read another, uh, another incident in the book of Galatians where, where Peter kind of denied Christ and kind of went the other way. Even after the first incident, he was still struggling with the same things. He still had this residual sin and, and cowardice he was dealing with. And I was like, he was still, it just kind of hit me. I never really thought of it before uh, the, reading through the book of Galatians. But even after the, 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 um, the incident in the Gospels, where, Jesus, where Peter denied Jesus, he was still kind of struggling with the same things. But Peter got back on track and lived a separated life again. 
He separated himself out for God once he got off track. God wants us back. The next thing is this, is John the Baptist was steadfast in his stand. He was steadfast in his stand. His messages, and guys, listen, you need to understand that our message, if you're a believer, your message cannot be watered down or permissive. John called sin, sin, and he confronted the issue regardless of whether he was speaking to just the regular person on the street, of whether he was speaking to the religious leaders, of whether he was speaking to politicians. He did not hesitate to confront people who were backsliders, to warn people about their eternal destiny, to tell people to repent and show fruits of righteousness. John did not back down from sharing the truth, no matter what. He didn't back down. Look in Luke 3, starting in verse 7. It says, Then he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Think about this for a minute. This is how John spoke to his fan base. All right? These people walked from their hometowns through steaming hot desert wilderness in the sun to hear that. How would you like if you came to church on Sunday morning, got all your kids ready, you sat down, did some worship, and and I spoke to you like that? You conniving, yellow-bellied, Brood of vipers. And John was serious, too. Would you come back to church the next Sunday? Well, I don't know if these people did or not, but John, he went right for the heart. When he said that particular verse, he was talking to the religious leaders. John was, or Jesus was also hard on the religious leaders. Anytime you see a conversation with Jesus talking to a religious leader, that's usually the people he's the hardest on. But John did not back off from his message. He spoke to his fan base like that. John preached to people to prepare their lives for the coming of the Lord. Look at verse 4 and 5. It says, that as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. We need to pay attention to John's message because, listen, Christian, our message is the same. When you go out and see people this week, this is the message that needs to be on our lips. We need to be telling people to prepare their lives for the coming of the Lord. Jesus is coming. When John was saying it, Jesus was coming the first time. Listen, when you and I say it, it's because he's coming the second time. Jesus is coming back. And we need to realize it's our job as believers to prepare people for that. To help them think, to get ready. To be ready when that time happens. Like at verse 17. He not only preached to prepare people for Jesus coming back. But he preached judgment too. It says in verse 17, His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. John wasn't afraid to tell people about judgment. Now this is one of the messages that I think has been lost in Christianity in our country. More and more churches will leave this part of the message, will leave this part of the Bible out of the message. Out of the preaching, out of the teaching. Listen, it doesn't matter what any preacher leaves out of the Bible. What's in this book right here is what's going to happen. What's in this book is what God tells us. Don't listen to anybody's opinion without checking out what God says. God's word is the authority. Not a preacher on TV, not this preacher, not any Sunday school teacher in here. This book is the authority. And this book warns us of judgment. Judgment. The Bible says that God is a consuming fire. We are all going to stand in judgment before God. God's going to judge each one of us individually. You're not going to have your husband or your wife standing next to you. You're not going to have your wonderful Christian aunt who raised you standing next to you, giving a defense for you. You're going to be standing before God by yourself, and He's going to review your whole life. The Bible describes in the judgment that when you stand before Him, God opens the books. What books? He opens this book. This is what He judges our life by. Have you obeyed all the things in this book? Have you obeyed all of His commands?
Have you obeyed everything he's led you to do in your life? This is, the, this is what we're judged by, by his commands. I got to tell you, none of us have obeyed it. The Bible says we're all lawbreakers. So how do you stand in the judgment? Well, in the judgment, you need to understand that you can't get salvation by trying to keep all the laws and commands in this book. The Bible says the only way for you and I to pass judgments is to understand that Jesus Christ has died on the cross to take our judgment away. Jesus suffered to pay the price for the judgment that you deserved. That's the only reason I'm going to be passing judgment. Not because I'm anything good, but because Jesus died for me. But we need to be warning other people about judgment that's coming. Because listen, if you don't have Christ, the Bible says you, you're going to pay for your own sins. Jesus paid for your sins so you wouldn't have to. But if you reject him, what you're saying is, I want to be judged by these words in here, by these laws. God, take me on. One of, my, uh, one of the shirts uh, people wear that or, or, or is probably the most interesting shirt is this kind of a, a rapper thing, but it's, uh, it says, only God can judge me. You ever see that shirt? Only God can judge me. Oh, whenever someone wears that shirt, I, whenever I see that in public, I just think, I don't think you understand what you're saying. Uh, you don't understand really what's coming. Uh, if you really understood that God was going to judge you, uh, I don't think you'd be bragging about it or boasting about it. If you really understand what that means, you better be fearful. We need to be fearful because our God is going to judge our lives. But John preached judgment. And you know what? We need to be preaching the same message. We're all going to be judged by God. Judgment's coming. Are you ready for it? Are you ready for it? See, that's the good news. This is, where, this is why it's called the gospel, the good news. This is where the gospel comes in. Judgment is coming, but God gave you a way to get through it. God gave you a way to escape. And John was preaching the same thing. He was preaching judgment and that there was an opportunity to repent and to get right with God so that you can get through the judgment. Listen, we're all going to be accountable to God in the, in the end. He said, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Why did John say that? Because there's wrath coming. That's not the only verse in the Bible that teaches that. The Bible says that God is going to judge this world with fire. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are people around you ready? Do they even know? Another thing I wanted to share with you is, since I've been here, it's only been a few months, I've had quite a number of conversations about the end times and God's timetable. It seems like there are a lot of people around us that are just aware that something's off in our world. Uh, it's a topic that when it comes up, you can just talk about for forever. If you come across someone that has this sense. And, you know, some people don't really know a lot about Bible prophecy or, or, or religious things, but they, they just have a sense that there's something off in this world. There's, I know God's up there and He's in control, and it seems like something's going on I can't quite put my finger on. They understand that times are really weird. There are crazy things going on all over the place. There's a trepidation in people's hearts. Guys, listen, if you're a believer and you know what the Bible says, you know how this world ends. You know how it ends. If you don't, you need to start reading the Bible because it tells us how it ends. The world gets crazier and crazier until Jesus comes back. And there's a lot of other details that we can talk about some other time. But the point is this. There are people that understand that this world is a little bit nuts. This world is in a downward spiral and it has to come to an end. People sense this instinctively just by looking at what's going on. And we need to use that sense of fear to tell people the truth. It's just not a paranoia, it's a, it's a real fear. We need to understand that the world is coming to a close. God has a new chapter. He's going to go up and people need to be ready. John was not afraid to preach this. He's like the guy that's standing out on the street with the sandwich sign. The end is near. The end is near. That's who John was. He's the end is near guy. And we, we need to all be the end is near guys. Because the end is near. Uh, there are uh, most Bible teachers 
and professors uh, that I've read say, you know, there's nothing that would stop Jesus from coming back today. There's nothing left to be fulfilled for the rapture to take place. It could take place at any moment. So we need to be ready. He taught people to turn to God with repentance and show it by a changed life. Look at verse 8. He says, Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. Bear fruit of repentance. You know what John was saying? This was his message. His whole message was repentance. It was turn from your sins and start living differently. Live the way that God wants you to. Don't keep doing the same things. You can repent and change. And guys, this is a great message. Because people need new lives. The message of the gospel is a message of a transformed life. It's a message of starting over. It's a message of getting a clean slate. And there's so many wrecked lives around us and people that don't know which way to turn. We have the best news available to anybody. The message of repentance is a message of a new life. And that's what John was preaching. He wasn't afraid to preach it either. Listen, John preached Jesus as the way of salvation and as the way of a changed life. Look at verse 16 in, in chapter 3. It says, John answered, saying to all, I indeed baptize you with water. But one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I am not even worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And he's indicating here that what Jesus can do in somebody's life changes them forever. He also wasn't afraid to preach about the social and moral issues of his day. Guys, this is where it kind of gets touchy for us, doesn't it? Because there's a lot of really hardcore social and, and moral issues in our day. It's becoming more and more difficult for Christians to stand up and say anything without there being consequences. Well, you know what? You and I should be worried about the consequences. You and I should just be worried about obeying God and getting the truth to people. It doesn't mean we have to be annoying it doesn't mean we have to chase people down and tackle them and tell them stuff. It just means that we stand for truth. We stand for truth. We don't have to be obnoxious about it, but we need to stand for truth. John went out and he preached on the issues of his day. And listen to me, John's goal was not political change. His goal was spiritual change. He preached to the politicians of his day. And they were kings, they weren't people you voted for. And you weren't necessarily allowed to talk bad about the king. But John did it anyways. They had no choice who was in office back then. Well, we might not get who we want in office, but listen. We don't know where they're gonna, what they're going to do anyways, even if you vote for somebody you like. Even if who you're voting for wins. Do you think they're going to do what you want them to do? Uh, probably not. I don't have a whole lot of hope in that. See, John wasn't trying to change the political situation. He wanted to change people's spiritual lives. But he went out and he preached it. He told the truth to this culture, to the world, to all the issues going on. Franklin Graham, son of Billy Graham, is about to go to a festival. I don't know if the festival has happened already. It's called the Festival of Hope in Vancouver. And he's one of the featured speakers there in Canada. And some people from some churches got together, some pastors and, and priests got together... And they said, we don't want Franklin Graham to come to our town. They actually had a letter, and they signed it, and, and they said, we reject Billy Gr or Franklin Graham coming to our neighborhood because he's, he's said some very uh, polarizing things. Listen to a statement that was in this letter that these pastors wrote. They said, Reverend Graham is a polarizing figure. His ungracious and bigoted remarks have the potential to generate serious negative impact on the Christian witness in Vancouver. Five evangelicals and Catholic leaders said in a letter, We denounce the frequent incendiary and intolerant statements made by Reverend Billy Graham, which, or, or Franklin Graham, which he unapologetically reiterates. What is it that he reiterated? What was the message that he was talking about that made these so-called pastors get up and say, We don't want Franklin Graham here. And they specifically pointed out to two things he was doing. He was preaching that homosexuality was a sin, and he was preaching that Islam will get you to hell. And you know what? All of our sin would get us to hell. It's not that that sin's any worse than mine or leads to a different place. Every one of us are sinners. And I don't believe uh, Franklin was speaking from a, a position of hate. And none of us ever should be speaking from a position of hate. 
We should never go and attack people. That's not what God's called you to do. He's called you to love people and to tell people the truth. But you need to, you need to be able to stand to do that. We don't ever hate anybody. And I know that's not what Franklin's heart is. I believe his heart is more like his dad's. But he stands up and tells the truth, no matter what anyone thinks. And there's one thing that's scary about this, is this was so cold Christians in the area. I believe these issues, particularly that they were uh, talking to, about Franklin about, are really two dividing lines. Uh, it's kind of an acid test now for uh, a, a church that's going to really preach the truth. Those two issues that I just mentioned is, well, you know what? Are you going to follow the Bible or not? You can kind of find out where a church is by looking at just those two, two issues anymore. But Franklin Graham wasn't afraid to stand up and preach the truth. And listen, we need to stand with Christians like that. Even if you don't necessarily agree with every point of doctrine or, or maybe how something is stated, when you see someone standing for truth, we need to stand with them. Luke one seventeen tells us that John came in the spirit and power of Elijah. Elijah was also known for bold, uncompromising stands for God's word. Elijah stood up against the pagans in his day and was used by God to get the truth out. In Luke 3.19, look at what it says there. But Herod the Tetrarch, being rebuked by him concerning Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, and for all the evils which Herod had done, also added to this, above all, that he shut John up in prison. Remember, Herod was the king. And John the Baptist publicly called Herod out on a sin that was in his life. It was a public sin. Everybody knew about it. And Herod kind of uh, uh, pretended to be Jewish in a sense. He was half Jewish. And he, uh, he just kind of put it all out there. And John confronted him publicly. And in response, Herod threw John in prison. And he eventually had his head cut off uh, later from that place. But Herod was re rebuked by John. He wasn't afraid to come out and tell the truth to anybody in any situation. You know, we need to be careful that as a church we don't lose our power. Our power is in our message. It's in our testimonies. It's in the way that we live our lives. And John is a great example for us. In 1 Thessalonians 2 it says, But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel... Even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. What's it saying? It's saying that you and I, if you're a Christian, God has entrusted you to share the gospel. He's put the most important message in the world in your mouth, in your hands. And he's told us to go out and give it to people who don't have it, who don't have life. So John the Baptist was uncompromising in his stand. Also, he was submissive to God's will. In John 1, 19, it starts out, Now this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He said, No. And they said, Who are you that we may give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? And he said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. He must increase, but I must decrease. That's another statement that John made about Jesus Christ in John 3.30. He must increase, but I must decrease. What's this saying? John was submissive. He was submissive to God's will. Our goal is not to promote ourselves. John's goal was not for John's name to be up in lights. It wasn't for John to become famous. It wasn't John, for John to become the greatest preacher that ever lived, even though... Jesus said he was the greatest man that was ever born of woman. His goal and our goal is this. Listen, church. It's not to promote us. It's not to promote First Baptist Church of Logan. Our job is to promote Jesus Christ. It's to promote him. He should be on our lips everywhere we go. We should be telling people about Jesus everywhere. He is who we promote. The Holy Spirit does the same thing. You know the Holy Spirit doesn't draw attention to himself when he, he's working in people's heart. He's drawing people's attention to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is he, who needs lifted up and who needs glorified. That's why John said, I have to decrease. And that's what we need to do. If we want Jesus to increase in our lives, we need to decrease. We need to get out of the way. We need to make our paths straight. Like John said, 
Listen, this world is crazy. There's a lot of paths that need made straight. But John was submissive to God's will. He put Jesus Christ first. And he said, I have to decrease. We don't promote ourselves. We promote him. And this is the last point. And then we'll go. John was a soul winner. He was a soul winner. John went after people's souls. When he saw people, he didn't just see their sin. He didn't care what particular sin that they were involved in, and neither should we. All we should see is that people are lost or saved. If you're lost, you need to be saved. You need your sins forgiven. You need to know Jesus Christ because apart from him, there's no life. Why did John sacrifice his whole life to go out into the desert to preach this message? Why? Because he wanted people to be saved. He wanted people to come to Christ. John 1, 6 says this, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. This is why he came, to be a witness of the light. And you and I are witnesses of the light also. We bear witness of Jesus Christ that He has the power to save us from hell, to save our lives, to turn our lives around. He says that John was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of the light. In John 5.35 it says, Jesus Christ called John a burning and a shining light. Can you describe your life like that in any sense? Is your life a burning, shining light? When people look at you, Do they see the light shining on Jesus Christ? Is he who we're promoting in our life? It says that John would turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He would turn many in the children of Israel. Listen, Jesus said, you shall be witnesses to me. This is what our purpose is, Christians. This is why we exist as a church. This place wouldn't even exist if if God didn't have this mission. You know why? Because when you got saved, he'd just take you to heaven. Why would he leave you down here with all this pain, with all this sin, still struggling with your flesh, with all the horrible hardships we still have to go through in life? Right? Why would he leave you down here? He's left you down here because of this mission. Your mission is to reach other people with the gospel, to be a soul winner, to see people the way that God sees them. We need to understand that we shouldn't be waiting for people to come to us. It's our job to go. That's the, that's the key word in the Great Commission is go. Not sit. Not wait for people to come. I want this place filled up. And we need to be inviting people to come. But it's not just about waiting for lost people to come here. We're told to go. It's our job to go after people. To look for the opportunities. To make the opportunities. To be a soul winner. And a lot of people, when... They're young believers and they're starting to try to evaluate what God's will is for their life. They kind of say something like this, God, I'm willing to do anything you want. I'm willing to be a preacher. I'm willing to to, to go to the mission field. All right, so whenever, whenever, if you want to do that in my life, it's fine. Just, you know, make it clear to me and help me to know uh, what you want me to do. One missionary turned it around the other way, though. He said, he said, most people are, are willing to go, but they're planning to stay. He said, why don't you be willing to stay, but plan to go? Turn it around the other way. We already know what our mission is. What are you doing for God? Are you sitting around waiting for Him to drop a note from heaven for a stork to come by with a little basket with instructions for what you're supposed to do in your life? He already tells us what to do. We need to plan on going, not sit around and wait for God to tell something He's already told us to do. We already have the commands. I'm not talking about going to a third world country or some faraway place. There are lost people here, people who have never met Jesus Christ, people who are in desperate need of His love. General William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army told his students this once. He said, if I had my choice, I wouldn't send you to school. I would send you to hell for five minutes. And then you would come back soul winners. How much of a concern do you have for people who don't know Christ? Do you understand that the coming judgment is a reality? But when you leave this earth, whether it's before he comes back or not, you can 
die before he comes back. But whether you die before he comes back or you're here when he comes back, you better be ready. You better be ready. Now I want to be found telling other people to be ready. Daniel 12.3 says, And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Listen, John was uncompromising in his message. He was spirit-filled. He lived a separated life. He was submissive to God's will. And he was a soul winner. And you and I need to be going after people. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes for a minute. The first group of people I want to talk to are maybe people who haven't been won yet. God tells the church that the church's message is to get the gospel to people, to tell people how they can have their sins forgiven and have new life. And Jesus died for you so that you can have that. He doesn't want you to become religious. He wants you to become forgiven. He wants you to have a new life. The Bible says that the only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. Not through a church or through a club or through your own moral standards or trying to make your own life right. You can't do that. No one can do that. The Bible says the only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. That's the only way for you to be prepared for judgment. Are you ready? If the world ended today, would you be ready? If Jesus came for you today, would you be ready? If you plopped dead in the seat you're sitting in, would you be ready to stand before Him? The Bible says there's only one way for you to be ready, and that is to be washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. He shed His blood for you to wash your sins away. Now I ask you again what I asked you early. How can you neglect so great a salvation? The Holy Spirit's tugging on your heart. If there is a stirring inside of you that you can't really explain, but you just know that it's nothing you've ever felt before, you've never experienced before, but you know something is going on, I want to tell you that might be the Holy Spirit tugging on your heart, drawing you into a relationship with Him, pleading for you to find forgiveness for your sins in Jesus Christ, because He is the only way that you can get it. There's no other way. And Christians, that's why we need to be strong. Is we preach a message that a lot of people don't like to hear. There's not a million different ways to God. Jesus said there's only one. It's an exclusive message. We need to be busy sharing it. Maybe God's speaking to your heart tonight about not being strong enough. Listen, I don't want you to go out and be obnoxious to people. We're not hate preachers. There's a lot of bad examples out there I don't want you to follow for sure. Our job is to love people, but to tell them the truth. If you love people, you'll tell them the truth. You'll tell them the way of escape. As we sing, if God's speaking to your heart about salvation, about becoming a stronger follower of Jesus Christ, and following John's example, I want you to listen to what God's speaking to you about and respond. And these front pews are open. Steps are open. If you want to come down and pray with anybody about anything, we'll have believers sitting here ready to pray with you, and we'd love to meet you and pray with you.